Welcome to the reading of Chesterfield King, The Blues Impostor. It's the story of J. Wade, John Henry Wade, a semi-professional, third-generation blues musician, who, like his pappy and grandpappy, never made nothing out of themselves. Having just been released from the federal penitentiary at Lompoc in California, he waits most patiently at a local bus station for his girl who never shows up. Act 1 Alone, upset, stranded and broke, threatened by rains approaching with the onset of winter, and after waiting for more than two hours, Jay grabs the first greyhound, which deposits him in the not-too-neighboring city proper of San Luis Obispo. On the streets, he strolls into a local bar, combination nightclub, to buy a warming cup of coffee, or perhaps a whiskey. Once inside, there is a commotion, a hubbub, over an open microphone talent contest that is about to begin. Accompanied by Chesterfield, his guitar, our man enrolls and sings his tune. Miraculously, Jay wins the contest and is immediately befriended by a grip and cameraman known only as Cleveland, or so he say his name is. Cleveland promptly introduces Jay to Bodine T. Mellonfire, an independent dilettante who prides himself on opening doors to the industry and just so happens is looking for new talent. Bodine makes Jay a simple offer, along with a modest cash advance, for exclusive rights of sole representation. Jay takes the matter up as fate would have it, and agrees to the opportunity set before him. In a rare moment of brilliance, over a whiskey, Bodine proposes the idea of recording all future events in a documentary format chronicling Jay's stories and music of past vice and love affairs. Subsequently, Jay unravels a string of bad relationships over the period of his sexually industrious life, drawing the conclusion that he would have perished in the jaws of the trap of invirtuous behavior had it not been for one incident. Recalling the occasion, while once strolling in San Francisco, he stumbled on a chance encounter with the beautiful gypsy girl, as they exchange far more than mere glances. As Jay puts it, two ships passing in the night. Even though they did it in broad daylight, Jay knows this is the girl he wants to marry. But it was not to be. The gypsy Told Jay of dark, torrid days that lie ahead. And only near the conclusion of his life would there be an old gypsy by his side. So Jay went back to New Orleans, which is full of gypsies, and stayed with Maggie Magoo, a madame, and also his auntie, who helped raise Jay and taught him how to play guitar. Nursing a rare depression of a sticky nature, of the likes he had never experienced before, no longer inspired to pay for love, he wasn't getting any. Baffled, he thought. He might have some kind of performance-related problem. Jay decides to go see the family physician. Dr. Turtle Grease, to question his state of poor libido. Thinking somehow, science and medicine, rather than money and whores, could render a cure. Oddly enough, irony plays its hand. 
In the course of disrobing in the examination room, the doctor's nurse mistakenly walks in. Stunned with fascination for each other, in a very embarrassing moment, Jay comes to full attention. As it is apparent, his condition is in complete remission. Cured of the ailment that had stricken him, the two fall in love and get married. Act 2 Jay and his lovely wife Mildred packed up and moved to Modesto, located in the fertile Central Valley of California, where it is said that peaches grow sweet on the trees. Once there, Mildred becomes pregnant. During her pregnancy, while Jay is off earning his keep, playing in a band of shifty blues musicians, hand-picked and assembled by himself, Mildred decides she requires something meaningful to occupy her time in the absence of her adoring husband. She thinks no better way to honor their love as to trace their family trees. What a mistake this turned out to be. Ominously, Mildred uncovers a bizarre turn, a disturbing nightmare. In fact, it was of such an appalling nature, she became ill, overwhelmed by panic. She is rushed to the hospital. Elsewhere, on the road in Bakersfield, Jay is informed by telegram and rushes back to Modesto, arriving at her bedside. Alas, but too late. She is dead, along with their unborn baby. Act 3 Jay struggles with the manner in which she died, and choosing to believe in her strength, is suspicious of what she must have been doing before the moment of her decline. He expects Mildred's personal effects will shed light on the murky truth. History is about to call Irony's hand and up the ante. Hank Henry Wade, Jay's pappy, herself a purveyor of excessive behavior and mismanaged lifestyle, at the time of his death, left behind a small son, that's Jay, and wife, that'd be Lily, who was again pregnant. Lily moved after Hank's death from New Orleans to greener pastures in the lower red light district of Myrtle Beach, Carolina, but was under severe economic pressure to raise a child with no money, no husband, and no job other than hookering, they alone on the way another little one. Ruling out a seventh abortion, she figured her only alternative for survival was a plot to remarry quickly. Hence, devise a scheme to find an unwitting bow of substantial wealth, pretending her pregnancy was a result of a slip-up in the bedroom parlor. Of course, matrimony would be the only solution to avoid further scandal. The infant baby, Jay, would be a hindrance to the execution of such a bold plan. So Lily left him, that's the infant, in New Orleans to live with Auntie Maggie in a honky-tonk off Bourbon Street. With Jay out of the way, Lily could hatch her plan. Lily set forth her focus on a dapper connoisseur of upper-crust Manhattan 
who was on holiday. That would be none other than Delmont Levine Crapper of the famous Toilet Bowl Empire. Executing her brilliantly laid plan, they were wed. Only thing left to do was to decide on a name for the phony little crapper. They agreed it would be Beauregard, if in a boy, and if in a girl, Mildred. That sounded very suspicious, and then, there it was. Jay found the instrument of destruction. A birth certificate stained by the very tears of the poor girl who gazed on proof of her malign beginnings. Inscribed at the top in gold scroll letters was the name given to the little girl, newborn baby, Mildred Crapper, daughter of Louise Howerton, and Delmont Levine Crapper. Jay was putting two and two together. Hmm. Crapper, the name of his mother's new bow. And Mildred, the name of his lovely just dead wife, meant holy mackerels. Jay married his sister. Lordy Lord. How the hell did that? If there was any time Jay required the comfort of a bottle, this was it. But unlike his wife or sister, he could not believe this instrument and was fixated on finding proof to his notion in order to cleanse their miserable souls of such an unholy union. Then suddenly, Fumbling out from between stuck pages of a photo album, what appears to be, no, not another one, but yes, a second certificate, similar to the first. And inscribed in gold scroll letters was the name of a little baby girl, Mildred Crapper, deceased, daughter of Louise Howerton, and Delmont Levine Crapper. What the hell was going on back then? Thought Jay. But even then, at this point, in a state of experiencing dementia, Jay had the mind to turn over the certificate, which revealed, scribbled, a confession of sort. From nonetheless, the old crapper himself. It read, I, Delmont Levine Crapper, having lost another, a second child to the hand of fate, only now, out of guilt, remorse, and sorrow, have the courage to admit the existence of my first daughter, Mildred, who I selfishly abandoned along with her mother, Rosalind Dauphine, many years ago, neither of whom I have heard from since. It is only now, with the loss of yet another little Mildred, plagued by carrying the crapper name, that I pledge never again to frequent in the bedroom parlors of soiled doves, and will instead devote myself fastidiously to my wife Louise, who can no longer bear children, and also to remain steadfast in searching for, finding, and paying retribution to my firstborn daughter Mildred Dauphine. God bless, she still be alive. Apparently, Delmont used to frequent the tenderloins quite often and had been targeted by another southern dove for matrimony. 
when Rosalind Dolphine put the screws to the old crapper, demanding he support the product of their union, he insisted he had already paid. Having little choice, she sent the little crapper baby to her aunt and uncle in Holyoke, Louisiana, just outside of New Orleans, later to be put up for adoption. However, this little crapper was not a Howerton weed crapper. It was a Dolphine crapper, who was later adopted by her aunt and uncle, who loved her. Turtle Grease, as in Dr. Turtle Grease, Jay's proctologist, who eventually grew up and moonlighted for the doctor as his nurse. So there you have it. This little crapper girl, now a turtle grease, was indeed Jay's lovely wife. Not the poor little dead crapper, rest her soul, was also named Mildred. But in fact, Jay's baby sister, whom he never knowed, and died shortly after birth from complications. Well, this all was enough to get anyone indigestion. For what it proved was Mildred died in vain under false pretense of erroneous notions. It being the final straw that drove Jay over the edge into a hysterical drinking or mongering interstate drug trafficking frenzy which lasted years, leading him up and into prison. Now, of course, over time, in the cooling off process of jail, Jay came to terms with his demons, and as a term of his parole, dedicated the balance of his life to telling his story so that others need not follow. Epilogue. Jay grew old and died in bed with his last wife watching over him. They had met years ago while strolling through the hills of San Francisco. You see, this was the gypsy girl who told Jay of the ill-fated romance that would impact him the rest of his life. She also told him he would die with an old gypsy by his side, and she honored his last wishes by burying Jay with his last vestige and most cherished possession, Chesterfield, his guitar.